Differences between socialism and communism. Both communism and socialism systems are secular in nature, but in my opinion, the primary differences between communism and socialism is that usually in a socialist society, you still have the right to private ownership. But the problem is that the nature of socialism is that it always leads to communism. And behold the famous quote by Vladimir Lenin, the goal of socialism is communism. Here are a few important doctrines taken from the Communist Manifesto that Marx and Engels advocated. Chapter 1. Bourgeois and Proletarians In depicting the most general phases of the development of the proletariat, we trace the more or less veiled civil war, raging with existing society up to the point where the, the war breaks out into open revolution and where the violent overthrow of the bourgeoisie lays the foundation for the sway of the proletariat. In chapter one of the Communist Manifesto, it clearly advocates violence. It advocates for a violent overthrow. It's funny because Marx and Engels make all these moral claims, but how can they make these moral claims and then, cl then advocate violence? This is just hypocritical on every level. Chapter 2. Proletarians and Communists The distinguishing feature of communism is not that the abolition of property generally, but the abolition of bourgeois property. But modern bourgeois private property is the final and most complete expression of the system of producing and appropriating products that is based on class antagonisms on the exploitation of the many by the few. In this sense, the theory of communists may be summed up in one single sentence, abolition of private property. In chapter two of the Communist Manifesto, it clearly advocates against private property and individuals being able to have businesses and producing their own means. Say you wanted to have your own business, uh, you could not do this because this is against communist ideology. Abolition of the family. Even the most radical flare up at this infamous proposal of the communists. In chapter two, the goals of communism are cited as one, abolition of property and land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. Two, a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. Three, Abolition of all right of inheritance. 4. Confiscation of the property of all emigrants and rebels. 5. Centralization of the credit in the hands of the state, by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly. 6. Centralization of the means of communication and transport in the hands of the state. 7. Extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state the bringing into cultivation of wastelands, and the improvement of the soil generally in accordance with a common plan. 8. Equal liability of all to labor. Establishment of industrial armies, especially for agriculture. 9. Combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries. Gradual abolition of distinction between town and country by a more equable distribution of population over the country. 10. Free education for all children in public schools. Abolition of the children's factory labor in its present form. Combination of education with industrial production. Moving forward in chapter 2 of the Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx clearly advocates against the family and, and says that this is an infamous proposal of the communists. This is communist ideology. Um, I love my family, I'm sure you love your family, and I'm sure a lot of communists love their family, but they don't understand that this is communist ideology that advocates against the family because they think it's oppressive, which it's not. It's, it's immoral to, to try to ab abolish the family. Now, I'm against abolition of children's factory labor, 100% I'm against slavery in all its forms. But to sit here and try to say that individuals 
are the cause of slavery and that the state could never perpetrate slavery is ridiculous because we can go throughout history and show that the state has coercively been enslaving people for, for as long as time has been recorded. Ironically enough, co communist China is the biggest perpetrator of slavery, factory slavery for that matter. So this, the, their reasoning for this just is non sequitur. Non sequitur. Chapter three, critical utopian socialism and communism. But these socialist and communist publications contain also a critical element. They attack every principle of existing society. Hence, they are full of the most valuable materials for the enlightenment of the working class. The practical measures proposed in them, such as abolition of the distinction between town and country, of the family, of the carrying on of industries for the account of private individuals, and of the wage system, the proclamation of social harmony, the conversions of functions of the state into a mere superindependence of production. All these proposals point solely to a disappearance of class antagonisms, which were, at the time, only just cropping up, and which, in these publications, are recognized in their earliest, indistinct and undefined forms only. These proposals, therefore, are of a purely utopian character. They, therefore, violently oppose all political action on the part of the working class. Such action, according to them, can only result from the blind unbelief in the new gospel. In chapter 3 of the Communist Manifesto, it clearly advocates that they must attack every principle of existing society. So when you see the professional protest movement, hijacking every movement and protest there is, you cannot be surprised that they are not trying to organize and dictate these movements because this is their ideology. It also advocates for the abolition of differentiating between town and country. And don't look any further than the United Nations that are trying to perpetrate this goal right now. Funny enough, Karl Marx indicates that these proposals are all purely of utopian character. And again, it's advocating abolition of the family. It's advocating against private property. Now finally, the last part that I highlighted out of this chapter is where Karl Marx summarizes saying that all communists therefore violently oppose all political action on the part of the working class. Chapter 4. Position of the Communists in relation to the various existing opposition parties. In short, the Communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. The Communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. They openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Let the ruling class tremble at a communistic revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Now finally in chapter 4 we see yet again that communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. So this is again where the, the professional protest movement comes in. It also says that the communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. So you, you should not be surprised when communists are so forward about their, their goals and how they're going to achieve them, no matter how violent they are. They really do think that this is the right thing to do. This is part of their ideology. Again, it's advocating violence. It says the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. So it's, this is a violent ideology.